Welcome to Liquid Margins, and this is a tale of two semesters evaluating social annotation at UMIN, which apparently they don't call it UMIN, but we needed to shorten our title, so apologies to University of Minnesota right off the top. Okay, and today's guests are Shauna Crossan. She's a spatial technology consultant in U Spatial at the University of Minnesota and the DASH program associate director. And she can probably tell us what DASH stands for. Um, and then Karen Jeanette, she's an instructional designer at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And then our moderator today is Jeremy Dean, VP of Education here at Hypothesis. And my name is Franny French, and uh, I'm your host. And uh, I will turn it over to Jeremy, and I will see you toward the back end of the show. Thank you again so much for being here, and I'll see you in the chat too. Welcome, folks. Um, very excited to be here. I've been working with Shauna and Karen for many years now. Um, they are the folks that brought Hypothesis to their respective campuses, to Duluth and to the Twin Cities, and it's been a great collaboration. Um, so I'm excited to have a conversation today, but today we're actually going to do liquid margins a little bit differently. Um, Karen and Shauna have been working with data from the hypothesis usage through the pilot and into subscription phases and have surveyed uh, instructors and students and looked at the results and looked at other data and are going to share that stuff with us uh, to start off. Um, so I'm actually going to hand it over to them to take that away and then we'll follow that with a conversation. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, I'm Shauna Crossan, and I'm gonna. We're gonna get started. Is that sharing working? Good. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We're uh, Karen and I are really excited to um, share this project we've been working on. Like Jeremy said, um, I've been working with Jeremy for I don't know how long on uh, different things, a couple years, several years, um, and luckily been able to work with Karen as well. And we'll explain a little bit about. Um, about about what we the project we've been doing and really would like conversation. So Karen and I'll try and rush through this quick um, and would love to have conversation and reaction and responses. So uh, again, my name is Shauna Crossan. Um, when I started this project, I was working as an academic technologist in the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. Um, I have switched positions. Now I'm a spatial technology consultant. That's a whole different ballgame, but um, stayed on to finish up this evaluation project. Um, the DASH thing, if you care, digital arts, sciences, and humanities. So all sorts of great fun things. Um, Karen. Yes, hello. I um, came into this a semester after Shana started it. Um, I have been the lead contact at the Duluth campus to pilot hypothesis. Um, so working with Shauna to develop an evaluation um, has been a treat to say the least. Um, we've learned a lot of things during this time. Um, and so um, I don't think I need to say any more right now, but I'm just excited to share um, our findings. So I'll let you go, Shauna. All right. So again, one thing, a caveat I wanna say, Karen and I are academic technologists. We are not researchers. So this, project was done as an evaluation of the tool and this evaluation of the pedagogy to help inform us. This was a new tool to us to help us inform how we were best going to support instructors and faculty in using this tool. This is not, I'm going to be very clear, this was not a formal research, was not formal research. We did not use research protocols. So just keep that in mind. All right, let's jump to the good stuff, uh, hopefully. Okay, a little bit about the University of Minnesota. We have five system campuses, um, we, the Twin Cities campus, uh, the College of Liberal Arts, which is where this pilot took place, has about 14 students. And you can see up here, uh, UMD, the Duluth campus has about 10,000 students and they did it uh, system wide. So that's just a little bit about uh, what we did. Uh, Rochester campus also piloted, but they didn't really participate in the evaluation. We included this slide just as a refresher of what hypothesis looks like in a Canvas course with the LTI, the integration. For us, the reason we piloted the, the integration was to make things like sign on and logins easier for students, easier for faculty to set up, and the grading was a big deal. So this was just part of, this is more just a reminder. 
our pilot, uh, we started, the College of Liberal Arts started the pilot in the summer, fall of 2020. It was part of the emergency remote teaching that we all lived through. Uh, the Twin Cities campus was the only one doing it. We had about 25 active courses, and I have to give a ton of credit to Dr. Bondong Chen, who I know is presented here, and his grad students, Jin Ranju and Hong Shui, for their help in getting this going. Spring of 21, um, Duluth campus joined us in this, still continuing remote teaching response. You can see the number of courses, about nine at UMD, about 30 at the Twin Cities campus. And fall of 21 was just more a regular usage. Um, and you can see the courses about 10 at UMD and about 50 at the Twin Cities campus. Our evaluation, again, this is evaluation. This was not formal research. After fall of 2020, our first semester, I did an informal student survey um, and interviewed faculty along with having conversations with faculty along the way. So really more anecdotal. Um, after spring of 21, we did a student survey. We had about 65 responses. And we did three faculty, faculty focus groups with nine faculty total, which were really, really impactful. I think Karen and I both found those very impactful. And fall of 21, we did a student survey with 89 responses and a faculty survey with, I don't know why that says 18, because it was really 17. So that's kind of what this presentation is based on. Uh, quick acknowledgments, um, Dr. Bodong Chen and the grad students, Jin Ron and Hong, I have to give a ton of credit to. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Remy Kalir and Antero Garcia. And Remy, I saw was here. Um, your wonderful, amazing book. This was not out when we started this evaluation. So, and we'll talk about this a little later. Um, so we would do things differently had this book been out, but it doesn't really reflect this book at this point. And that's one of our future goals. Okay, quick basics. And then I'm gonna turn it over to the good stuff. We found in our survey that about 65 percent of the students had never used a social annotation tool before the semester that they did the survey. So that was interesting. About 35% had used it. Um, and of that, 22.8 was perusal, 3.5% was some an unnamed tool, and 28% was hypothesis. We do not know if students answered, um, like the same students answered semester to semester, if students might have filled it out for two classes. We did not include those kind of controls. So that's what we have. Oh, I forgot to fix that slide. Um, how difficult or easy was it to learn hypothesis? Um, we wanted to know how students were interacting with the tool. Fortunately, we found about 86% of the students found that it was relatively easy to learn how to use hypothesis. So, so that was, um, we were relieved to hear that. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Karen. Yeah. Um, can I? I'll try screen sharing one more time. There we go. All right. So we wanted to be able to see how instructors were using the tool in class reported by students. So one of the first questions we asked was what kind of uses were students seeing? And so our top five list is that number five, students were using annotations to help with assignments such as reactions, papers, and other writing assignments. Number four, they were referring to annotations within class discussions, and those might have been class discussions um, in person or in Zoom. Number three, they were asking each other questions in hypothesis or discuss the readings in hypothesis. And as you might expect, number one, students posted their own questions and reactions right in the reading. We also wanted to know um, what kind of functionalities students were using in Hypothesis. And um, we had about six students report that they were using or linking to images, video, and multimedia. Um, so that might be as expected. Again, some of this was during remote, remote, emergency remote instruction. And um, I don't know if there was a lot of capacity to try a lot of new things, um, but we think that there's room for growth to linking to images and video um, in the future. Additionally, most more students reported using groups and tags than images and media, especially once Hypothesis um, made the Canvas integration 
um, the group featuring Canvas integration work with Hypothesis. Um, we saw more growth in that tool. Um, but generally speaking, in our survey, about 22 students reported um, breaking into groups and about 25 reported using tags to identify topics. So one of the uses for tags, um, we did have some uh, classes use tags for identifying the instructor um, if they had a question or needed help um, so students could tag their annotation with instructor or they might tag their annotation with a role, such as if they were supposed to summarize something in the reading for a group, they would click summarizer um, and then all those annotations would summarize. So those were some interesting uses. We think that there's um, room for improvement there and that perhaps in the future we can work with instructors to think of other uses um, to use tags and categorize annotations. Next, student survey results, the interaction part. So as academic technologists and instructor, instructional designers, we often think about four types of interaction when we're trying to create um, positive learning experiences. And we keep in mind the student to learner face interaction because the students are going to have to go through something to interact with the material um, in online environments. Then we think about student to content, student to student, and student to instructor. And so we were mindful of these interactions. So keeping this in mind, we actually focus primarily in the evaluation on student to learner interface, um, student to student, and student to instructor. So you'll see that reflected in the coming slides. We asked this question. Hypothesis is designed to help students understand class readings by encouraging interaction around the material and how helpful were the following aspects of hypothesis. So we'll share those. Um, first, we wanted to understand the tool. How helpful was it to have um, hypothesis or find, excuse me, I'll just start right over. Students found the proximity of hypothesis to the reading and discussion very helpful. 80% um, of students found it moderately or very helpful to have annotations in proximity to reading, but 95% found it at least slightly helpful. Um, one student uh, quoted that it forced everyone to closely read the articles, which caused better class discussions. So students found the ability also to ask questions before class helpful. 85% um, found it at least slightly helpful, but even more found it um, moderately to very helpful to ask questions before class. Additionally, um, we asked the question, how was having guidance from my instructor? Um, how helpful was it to have guidance from my instructor about the reading? And 99% of students said it was at least slightly helpful um, to have this um, assistance from instructors. So what does guidance look like? Well, some of our instructors were annotating the text ahead of time. Um, some provided rubrics for the quality of conversations and annotations. Um, and some were simply just in the annotations, answering and responding to questions um, with the students. So we found that instructors were pretty intentional about creating active learning strategies around reading and signaled to the students that it was pretty important. And so we think um, that gave students also um, quality interactions with their instructors. Moving on to um, interacting with classmates, 96% of the students found it at least slightly helpful, but more so even moderately and very helpful to interact with classmates. Some of the students said, um, nice to have classmates feedback on my questions in the text. It's nice to see what everybody thinks about the reading while also seeing the teacher's comments. Those were a few quotes that we thought, thought were fairly representative. Um, and then again, it also um, really forced everyone to closely read the articles which caused better class discussions and it made the reading more interesting and engaging. Another consideration um, we wanted to know about was how did students find it helpful to share their knowledge and experience? And 95% of students did find it helpful to share their own knowledge and experience. 
In the focus groups, uh, faculty said students shared their own experiences and the annotation that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and students sharing were sharing prior knowledge and experience and felt it was somewhat safer um, because it was tied to the reading and not a, a bigger idea, question, or concept. So I'm going to switch back to Shauna, who's going to take another section of the slides. All right, we're going to jump into a, another sort of look at uh, comparing these two. So we had the advantage of having multiple different types of, of places to ask questions. We asked questions both of faculty and of students. So this is a space where we um, looked at the two of them together and um, Karen and I at least came up with an editorial comment. We'll talk about that. So we asked students, we wanted to know how impactful was it to them for them to have hypothesis and how they understood the material for the course and the content. And um, so we asked this question, 62% of them said it was somewhat more and much more. I thought this was interesting, a much lower number was in the much more, um, and this was higher in the somewhat more. And about 34% of students said it was about the same. So we asked this question after, well, we asked this question in both spring and fall, but while we were looking at these results, we were also talking to faculty. And we heard things like this from faculty. I can see what they don't understand. Um, and the faculty said, you start class knowing where they struggled with the text. You can, uh, otherwise, you know, the faculty would know where they thought, but this way they knew exactly where they were so they could prepare better and address better. So, and I, I will say that, oh, these are the way, but this is what students did say they saw faculty doing, even though they didn't think it helped them understand better, this is what they saw faculty doing that faculty referred to annotations and class discussions um, that they uh, so that that in discussions like in person in class whether it's zoom or in person that faculty referred to the discussions they faculty um, added information and posed questions in the reading to guide reading to learn reading um, and they responded to student annotations. This was all big and we'll talk about this in a minute. So all these things are what students were observing, yet they didn't think it really impacted their comprehension. So this is where I'm gonna pause for our Karen and I, we have an editorial note. This was just a huge, jumped out at us the whole time when we were looking at this. Students did not necessarily think they were understanding the material better, but instructors were adamant. And I would say in the faculty, the focus groups were almost giddy with the impact that hypothesis had on student comprehension. And this was material that they had taught many times before. And many of the instructors involved in this commented on how much better the students comprehended the material. So we have sort of a dichotomy, you know, kind of a contradiction between what students thought and what faculty thought. Um, we did note that faculty theorized that students who are, that are already good readers might not notice the difference um, but special, especially the students who are not as skilled or who are jumping into academic reading at a different time saw an improvement. So anyway, um, just note to all of you out there, this might, we thought this would be an interesting place to dig in and do more research. Um, so that was uh, just a big, a big jump to us. And I want to say hi to Shinran. I didn't know you were here. Exciting. So a little bit of review about the facts, the folk faculty results, both the focus groups and the surveys. Um, we asked in the fall survey, what impact did you see on student learning and engagement as a result of using hypothesis? Instructors said these things were better. Engagement with, with instructors was better. Engagement with students was better. Students were better prepared for discussions. There were some improved grades and there was better preparation for writing. Again, these were 17 responses. There is a caveat here and an asterisk. I just want you to notice my asterisk. Um, this reflected what we heard in focus groups and what was reported on the surveys. This was not done with any research comparing grades before and after or same sections or that type of thing. So this is definitely a space where I'd love to see some more research. And I know um, Remy, I think Remy Kalir is doing some of that in Indiana and there's some other places. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of that work. But we were excited to see this. Um, some of the follow-up questions we had for instructors Again, based on what we heard in the focus groups, we asked them, um, we gave them these statements and we asked how much they agreed or disagreed with these statements. And for the most part, these, they felt that students were better able to break down and comprehend text. 
They felt that instructors could see where students were struggling. They felt that the instructors understood student learning at a deeper level and had a different insight into <clears throat> student, what students were learning and what they were struggling with. And many of them felt that students had better questions about the content. I love this quote. Um, this was really an impactful quote for both Karen and I when we heard this. We had an instructor tell us that, um, she said, it is so seldom that we get to hear every voice in our classroom. The fact that I have three ideas from everybody is relevatory for me. This was an instructor who just had students annotate, a, it was like a three or four page article. She required them to each contribute about three ideas. And she said it's the first time in a class that she had heard that much from all of her students. Um, and it really changed how she was teaching. Um, this is kind of same, similar to this, uh, faculty member said, seeing the same thing from different perspectives that came out, that came out rather quickly. I did not to facilitate that in class. And normally you'd have to use a lot of class time. Related to that, several instructors said that basically you started class already halfway through the material. You didn't have to do that background review and you could just jump into the discussions. One more question that, or comment that sort of reflects this multiple perspectives. And this is something, a, a caution I wanna take out. And this is one of the things I wanna to refer to um, the book annotation on is sort of this concept of power and where that fits in here. And this was definitely something we talked to instructors about. This student commented, um, it put pressure on me to respond with the right thing about a certain topic. So even though you're getting multiple perspectives, our students, where we think students are feeling very comfortable sharing, be very conscious of how students might not feel comfortable sharing and feel like they have to go along with the flow. Um, her example was sharing about abortion and people having their own opinions. Um, so it was just something really to be careful about. Um, then this one really jumped out at us. Karen, are you? No, this is me still for a little bit. Okay, grading annotations. Um, we asked students only in the fall of 21, so this was just one of the surveys. They, we asked them if they, if their annotations were being graded or getting points, if they were earning points, participation points, whatever for this. And 97% said that they were sometimes or always given points. And we also thought it was interesting that 95% thought it was at least slightly useful to have some sort of a motivation or a point reward on this. The faculty response was a little bit different. Um, that I think they weren't all doing that, but it, I think it's important to see that students really felt that that was important and a good motivator. We asked instructors, how often are you responding to annotations? And you can see here, most of them said almost always, most of the time, sometimes, and almost never. When we did ask students that directly, I think it was more on the sometimes and almost never end. So student perception and instructor perception might be a little different. Um, don't know exactly on that. We did not go into any courses and measure or see what the reactions were. Again, that's a great space to jump and do some more research. Um, and in the future, we asked students if they would like to use hypothesis in the future. Most students, you can see most of them were yes. Um, I want to point out this one, it's really hard to see, I know, um, just a screenshot from our tableau of the data. Depends on how it is used. And you can see how high that number is. Now, Karen, I don't think we have a percentage on that, but a, a fairly significant percentage of students said, yes, they would use it, but it depends on how it was used. And we'll talk about that, address that in just a minute. Um, one of the ways we look at how it is used, um, and this is a, a quote that Karen and I keep coming back to these two quotes and these opposing opinions about student feeling and thoughts about using hypothesis, kind of how it's used and its presence in the classroom. Um, we have our social butterfly on the one hand, who says, it's the only way I can focus on the reading because there's constant annotations to see how my classmates are feeling about the reading or when the professor, um, the professor adds a note to further clarify. Um, that we heard quite a bit, that type of thing. Um, and then on the other hand, that every time Karen and I need a little laugh, we go read this quote from the DIY student, the student who just wants to do it themselves. I don't get the point. I can read just fine without other people. The teacher should either use it for some purpose or skip it. So there, the students, there's two sides of the story. Some students really love it and have that piece and other students don't care. So that lends us to the, brings us to the point of instructors need to be very purposeful in how they're using it and why. Um, Karen, I think it's you. 
Yes, Karen's gonna finish it up here. Karen, you're muted. Thank you. Um, instructor feedback. In summary, this is what we heard. That accountability, um, it hypothesis definitely helped with accountability and discussion preparation. And we would say accountability, 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 but also I think motivation was just as much a part of the equation there um, because students liked revisiting comments and areas of reading. Students liked hearing what other students thought, what their instructors thought, and that really um, helped them reread and be engaged with the materials. Additionally, we saw and heard from um, the faculty and, and student comments that students were learning from each other, um, not just about the content, but also how to read and, and critical thinking and some of these skills. Um, so that was encouraging to learn about. Students, um, we heard a lot of students or a lot of instructors providing guided readings in direct proximity to text, and that was very valuable. It motivated and encouraged students to do the reading and respond. And faculty used hypothesis as a promising strategy for deeper learning and engaged class discussions. This came out quite strongly in our faculty focus groups and that how good the in-class discussions became as a result of having discussions prior to class and as a result, of course, of reading. And Shauna, do you wanna take these next few? Yes, why don't you just keep sharing? Um, we did, we learned a lot about increasing reading skills. This came out quite a bit in several different <clears throat> um, areas. And I would say one of them just as sort of a story, an anecdote was in language learning. We had one instructor who taught Finnish, Finnish language. Um, and he talks quite a bit about how he uses um, hypothesis to clear, so he can use um, culturally authentic materials. He can use Finnish websites and Finnish newspapers and all those materials using hypotheses to provide vocabulary support, cultural support, those types of things so students can read um, deeper into, into the materials. Um, in terms of insight and intervention, uh, Karen, if you want to go to the next one, we also heard, and we talked about this earlier, that faculty felt they had a better window into student understanding about a topic. And one story I'm going to share is a faculty member who was teaching a class that discussed a lot of difficult concepts around race and racism, which were new concepts to some of the students and how it was being discussed. And she felt that using hypothesis gave students sort of a scaffolded way of approaching and learning that content and being able to process it in a safer space asynchronously, then they were better prepared to go into discussions in the class, and then they followed up with reaction papers afterward. And she noticed a progression in how students were responding and, and um, uh, processing those difficult concepts. Um, and I ran into her just a couple of weeks ago, totally away from work. Um, and she told me that she will not teach again without hypothesis um, because of how it helped um, deal, especially with those difficult concepts. All right, well, finally, we'd like to share our recommendations for instructors um, that we serve uh, using um, the insights from our evaluation. So um, when we first got the um, feedback back, we looked and we had a question about what needs to be improved from students. And we had all of these comments and like, what's going on? We didn't know, didn't get a lot of negative feedback, but there were a couple cases where the PDFs weren't working so well and students really did not like that because it affected their ability to use um, the hypothesis to annotate. So um, make sure your PDFs work. We found um, hypothesis has a great OCR tool. It's very easy to use. It's, it's easier than Adobe. Um, and also um, hypothesis, is, there's support, say this three times, support, success representatives um, helped us um, occasionally when we had um, PDFs that were hard to deal with. But make sure those work. 
Um, students having instructors interact with students and hypothesis really leads to their satisfaction satisfaction in their engagement materials. Um, so try to think about um, interacting. Um, you can create an assignment where students just read and respond to each other, but the satisfaction seems to really improve when instructors are engaged in the reading as well. Um, and as a close follow-up, referring to annotations in the discussions and in-class discussions is something that instructors really appreciate, or excuse me, students really appreciated. They like to, to have the discussion move from hypothesis into class. Um, fourth, we heard even though hypothesis is pretty intuitive for most students, they still wanted instructors to model how to use it. Just a brief um, demonstration in class and then a little bit of support documentation and in the instructions um, goes a long way. Fourth, going back to our social butterfly and do-it-yourselfer type opposing opinions, um, there is a visible, not visible button on hypothesis, and we will tell instructors how um, students can use that to hide the annotations if they prefer to leave their annotations without seeing others in the future. So that is something we will be mindful of sharing. Um, and then if you're using hypothesis um, for consecutive assignments, we suggest varying the assignments even just slightly, um, just to make each experience a little bit different and novel. Um, yeah, varying the structures of assignments or considering use of group work, categorizing um, the annotations with tags or scaffolding assignments. Um, is another idea where you're using annotation to build ideas and then you're summarizing them to post in a paper or in a Canvas discussion or synthesizing it in another way can make um, the assignment very interesting. All right, so those are our final recommendation. And what's next? Well, we want to write up a list of use cases and learning activity suggestions um, for our instructors um, to help with um, come up with some of those new ideas and to make each assignment just a little more interesting. And then Shauna, you have the book. You have to hold up the book. As um, a follow-up, oh. we... <laughs> yes. Am I saying Shana, okay? <laughs> you go, go Shauna. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to hold it up in front of me so you can see it. Um, we are, Karen and I are going to be reading the book in cooperation with a couple of faculty this summer um, and to be able to better incorporate the concepts from um, the book into evaluation and into development of other pedagogical, um, pedagogical approaches. So thank you so much. That's our, our next step. And with that, um... If others have questions, we'd be happy to, to answer them at this time. Uh, Jeremy, you're on mute. And also someone wanted to know if you can hold up the book again because they couldn't see it. Can you guys hear me now? Oh, I think it's because of your virtual background. It's, oh yeah. Yeah. Go. yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Jeremy. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much for that uh, exhaustive exploration of, um, of all the great usage we've seen at the University of Minnesota, uh, Twin Cities and Duluth. Um, a lot of really interesting uh, things going on. Uh, there's been some questions that have been asked in the chat, um, but I wanted to ask a couple questions before we open it up. Uh, Sean has been very good at answering the ones in the chat, but I'm really interested in the, the point that you guys highlighted about the, the student who said, um, or rather the, the number of students who said, yeah, I'd like to use it again if it was, you, if it was you, if, depending on how it was used, right? And even the student that was negative, like it should be used for a purpose. And just talk a little bit more about like, what does purposeful use of social annotation or hypothesis mean, and actually, maybe we should start off with like, what would a purposeless, or how does how does a purposeless usage, is there a purposeless usage, or how does the appearance of a purposeless usage happen? I don't know. Maybe you guys can riff on that, starting with uh, Shauna. Um, yeah, I, I have some examples of of 
things that we heard that I, I don't know if I would say purposeless, but I would say could use more thought. Using it every week for the same things over and over. Having an, a, one instructor who fully admitted she didn't do this right as she had them annotate. I don't care how many was it, it was like 20, 18. 18. It was a huge number of assignments, articles, just always the same thing over and over again. I know one instructor used it this semester and I worked with her to pull it back and to put some variety instead of always having them use hypothesis, make it something, you know, specific question or a specific purpose or a specific point differently in each reading because otherwise it gets just redundant and not engaging if they're always doing the same thing. Um, yeah. I'll I would say the make three comments and two replies model is okay the first time and then yeah. the second time, you know, asking them to specifically look for something or do something. And that's where Karen and I felt that the images adding visual, like visualize what you're reading, go find a GIF or an image that represents that, you know, mix up how you're doing that. You know, it's great to use hypothesis for all the weekly meetings, but yeah, don't always do the three comments and two replies. And tags could be helpful there too, right? In this particular reading, Absolutely. I want us to think about these themes. So when they come up, maybe tag your annotations with those themes. So there's a little bit of a, a new scavenger hunt every single time um, that you uh, that you annotate. But I think that's really interesting, the idea of being more purposeful uh, and deliberate in your uh, annotation assignments. Um, because, you know, on some level, I believe annotation is sort of a, a good in and of itself. Um, I think to some extent, you know, it is writing in tech, writing your book is, you know, something people have done for a long time to help with comprehension and analysis, but, but really helping lay bare for students what that means exactly. What is the work that we're doing? What different types of work are we doing with this tool? And making that part of the assignment and making that, making that part of the instruction and making that part of the sort of development of skills related to annotation, um, I think would invest it with more obvious purpose. Um, uh, so that, that was uh, an interesting one. Um, all right, uh, thing just popped up here. Uh, maybe this is a comment or a question. Um, I, the other question I wanted to ask, and then we'll open it up in the last 15 minutes here. Um, that student who was worried about saying the right thing. Is that something else that can be um, avoided? with more purposeful use of the tool tool. Let's talk about that piece of feedback. The reluctance to speak because you were or the reluctance to freely speak because it was feeling like you had to say a certain thing. I think um and, and we didn't hear that a lot, but I'm guessing that is more present than we heard about. It just especially if you're talking about difficult concepts. And it was a different class than the class that was dealing some of the real um the complex issues around racism. I think that is that can center around hypothesis, but it also requires a, a culture in your class that will make you know, that you're addressing that over and over again. And that's one of the reasons we also really recommend that there's an instructor presence. And I mean, you all know this. This is why the instructor presence in the annotations is important because if there is any sort of I'm mean, gonna just use the word bullying. If there is any of that, or you're seeing, sensing that students are afraid to comment or that there's people attacking other students for what they're saying, that I think that has to be addressed as a class culture, but also a very purposeful assignment in, or you know, a topic of one of the assignments could be, we're looking for controversial things in this assignment and we are not gonna be attacking people for saying what they think. I don't know. Yeah. That's just off the top and, of my head. Yeah, and also I think we'd be interesting in, interested in hearing how people um, facilitate, you know, those discussions of diverse opinions and um, how they're making students, you know, helping them not do group think, but also feeling comfortable in the space that they're in. So definitely more research, more learning there. 
Yeah, I think the, the point about instructor presence is a really good one. Uh, of course, you know, that's asking more of our already overworked instructors, but I do think that's an important piece of uh, not just moderation um, and, and motivation, but I think it actually ties back also into the question of being purposeful, right? If your instructor's there responding, engaging with you in conversation, it's hard to say that it's <laughs> a useless activity, right? Because it's, it's sort of obvious that somebody's listening to you, somebody's responding to you, hopefully it becomes clear that that's uh, a generative um, conversation and kind of the bone of what we do in, in academia. Um, all right, uh, Shauna or Karen, has there anything in the chat? Shauna, you've been very vigilant there. Um, thank you for that. But anything that you think is worth surfacing in the oral space here is, uh, I know you were quick to answer some of the questions, but anything you'd like to, to surface and elaborate on from the chat? Uh, I've been distracted by the questions too, which is <laughs> fine. I shouldn't it's be hard. answering them as I go. Um, I wanted to address a couple of people have asked about the Canvas course, and I think I, I'm not going to go distract myself looking for it right now. I, I'm not sure if that's something that's limited just to University of Minnesota logins, but that's something I think um, Hypothesis has a lot of those same resources. Um, we just packaged them into a Canvas course because that was something that um, faculty at the University of Minnesota were used to using. Um, so honestly, most of it was, much of it was pilfered from hypothesis. <laughs> so, yeah, it's our, it's our basic practice when we're able to, for any school that we're partnering with, to set up a course that's for instructors and instructional designers mm -hmm. that has resources and can be a kind of hub for a pilot or an ongoing subscription to the tool, um, but also a space to play. Um, yeah. So whenever we can, we'll set that up in, in your LMS instance. Um, but of course, those are restricted by the, the logging into the to the instance. So yeah, I doubt that people can get into the Minnesota one. We supplemented it with um, specific examples from the college's courses. We had a couple videos in there um, that were doing some specific trainings that I think we took out because things changed. Um, so. I'm no longer managing it, so I don't know what else they've done to it. Veronica asks about automatic grading um, mm. in the uh, chat. Um, do one of you guys want to answer if there's automatic grading available? Um, Karen? <laughs> well, it's certainly easier to grade with the Canvas integration um, in SpeedGrader, so there's that. Um, there is not automatic grading. However, um, I do work with one instructor that uses a, a rubric that allows you to grade. And so she sets the criteria and then she goes through and, you know, clicks where they fall in the rubric and that expedites her grading quite a bit. So is that something that she could share or she'd be willing to share ever? Or? Um, yes, or I could um, simply... Um, I mean, you can set up the LTI or the, the uh, hypothesis learning tool on Canvas, and then there's also a rubric. So if you create an assignment in Canvas, you can click the plus rubric button. And I think if you do that before you install hypothesis, then um, the rubric will be in the assignment. Right? But I think you have to do it before you install um, the hypothesis so, in the assignment. Thanks. So the answer, the answer to Veronica's question is no, there's no automatic grading right. with hypothesis. There are some other platform reading platforms that do have kind of algorithmic grading. Um, but what Karen's been describing is we have a pretty deep integration with the gradebook functionality in the LMSs and especially with Canvas with their speed grader and you can add a rubric. Um, but our, our model is at least for now uh, and our focus is on you know, making the student work visible to the teacher um, and allowing them to design the rubric or algorithm, if you will, for um, for their evaluation uh, and feedback to students rather than uh, fully automating that. Um, anybody in the audience want to raise a hand? Is that possible in this context? Uh, for there's, anywhere? A, there's a question from... Um... Ramey, um, that he wanted to know. That guy? <laughs> I know, right? Uh, he wanted to know what, what disciplines um, were covered in this work. And you might have mentioned that in the beginning, but. We did not mention that in the beginning. So thank okay. you all. I, Karen, we never even 
but never occurred to us to mention that's that. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did put a couple in the chat, just, but let me just run, I've got our list um, up here. Everything from a course on um, introduction to Buddhism through our Asian and Middle Eastern studies, um, a history of dance, um, an education course on assessment of secondary students, several English courses. Um, I know our first year writing seminar is using it now. I, that They were not part of this evaluation. Several language courses, Finnish, German, Spanish, journalism, linguistics, many history courses, which is very near and dear to my heart. Um, lots of language, Russian. What are we, we missing? Have, we have um, philosophy using it here, um, several language, Spanish, I think predominantly here, uh, French. Uh, writing and um, education. I think we have two or three instructors in education um, using it as well. Wow, that's that's quite the breadth of disciplines. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, other questions in the chat? I'm just going to address um, Samantha's question about STEM. Um, on the Twin Cities campus, it was used only in the College of Liberal Arts, which uh, most of the STEM departments at the University of Minnesota are often like the College of Science and Engineering or the College of Biological Sciences. So um, that's why uh, my, the ones from the Twin Cities campus tend to, le to lean humanities type courses. Um, can I just quick talk about Alan's comment and then I'm gonna stop talking. Um, Getting students to return to an annotation for in discussion, that is definitely an issue that came up from instructors was, you know, the first students would go out and make a comment and then getting people to come back, which is one of the reasons one of the instructors had students write reaction papers based on those annotations and that was a great way to get students to come back. Um, but that is a comment we heard quite a bit. We have um, another instructor. Um, that requires, um, and she like just makes them separate assignments in Canvas. Um, so it's kind of like a prompt in Canvas to return back to the conversation. But then she also uses a Google form and has, you know, after the students spend a bunch of time conversing um, in the um, margins, they reformulate their questions to submit before class. And so that really gets them thinking about their questions again and preparing for class and they get some points for submitting um, the questions. So that's one strategy that seems to work well. Can I quick respond to this question about the video? Um, it, it wasn't annotating video and multi multimedia, it's using video um, and images in annotating written documents, because I, as far as I know, the hypothesis is an annotating video. So, um, but yes, we absolutely include, and the way they have annotated video is by using the transcripts. And I, I, I know of some people that have done that, but we're talking about having, um, having people, having students add visualizations and using visualizations to reflect what their reading is. Um, and there's been some, there's some great stuff when that happens. You know, one of the things that um, that I'm thinking about as we wrap up here is just uh, the 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 work we've done over the, the years. Right? There's clearly a value to your faculty um, in this tool. But one of the neat things about uh, somewhat new technology and early adopters like the University of Minnesota is um, learning about potentials we haven't explored collaborating together on going and, and, and you know implementing the things like adding more multimedia. So I think one of the really great things about the partnership that we have, the University of Minnesota, uh, Duluth and, and CLA, which just renewed their contract yesterday. Sean, I don't know if you know that. <laughs> um, I did not and I'm thrilled, good. Yeah, uh, so totally done deal for next year. Um, is that we can now and I know, Shauna, you've moved on. We're, we're connecting with some other folks, you know, that in your former office and and Karen, you're still there is that we can work together to expand and deepen the practice uh, of social annotation at, 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 at these college, at these universities and campuses um, based on, you know, the really reflective work that you guys have done with the initial cohorts. So um, thank you very much for all that work. 
Um, I guess now I just had a question in the middle of my sort of closing statement, but um, the, the faculty focus group was something I'm not sure that I've seen at other pilot institutions. And can you just talk a little bit more about how that was run? Because um, I think it could be a cool model for other schools that are really being deliberate in their exploration and adoption of technology, not just of social annotation, in terms of really getting high quality feedback from those early adopters. Karen, you want to run with that one? Oh, the faculty focus group. So mm -hmm. we ran those in spring, um, at the end of spring, and we had three sessions and um, a list of questions to run them through. And I think we had five, they were virtual sessions. So we had five faculty approximately in each of the three sessions. And we just ran them through the questions and we recorded the uh, sessions just for our own use um, and took notes. Um, and then reviewed the notes and, and came up with a new list of questions then to, to put in a follow-up um, survey. So that, I mean, that's a kind of a higher overview. Um, but it was just wonderful to have them all together. And, um, you know, we had everybody taking turns ask, asking and answering questions, but putting them all together in a room where they can kind of reflect together. There was a lot of yes and statements um, that help us uncover um, some of the aspects of use that we were um, wanting to know. I, I felt like faculty really enjoyed the opportunity to, yeah, to talk together about things. Um, and it was great because Karen and I just stayed out of the way and let them um, converse. We had thought, and we never did this, let's create sort of a community of practice and maybe CLA will pick this up now next year is creating a, a annotation community of practice, which um, because faculty really, we did have a couple of those where we had conversations um, and it was great to see people getting ideas from each other, sharing solutions, sharing problems and how they fix things and ideas. It was really, um, it was really, really good. Hey, I'm just going to jump in to say we're right up again, done. up of the hour that went by so quickly. I couldn't believe when I looked at the clock. Um, go fast. Yeah. Any uh, closing uh, remarks from anybody before we wrap this up? And also thank you for staying on a little later and apologies to, you know, we hadn't quite decided if we were going to do that. So normally I would have advertised that to people. Thanks yeah. all for listening to us and uh, letting us share this experience. I'm sure it's all things all of you already know. So <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank I you. Look, I look forward to the continued partnership. collaboration. Yeah. Likewise, thank you Absolutely. all. Thank you. And I just wanna, uh, yeah, thank you to our wonderful guests and to Jeremy and Aaron. And also I think she had to leave, but Becky who was holding down the chat. Um, we have such a great uh, group today. So um, we will see you next time on Liquid Margins. Take care everyone. <laughs>